Hey everyone, Bob here, KD4 BMG HOA Ham. Today we're going to talk about the TID Radio TDH8. You can say, Bob, you're late to the party. Every ham radio YouTuber has already talked about this radio, and perhaps not all of them, but many videos have come about on this particular radio. I'm not going to talk about how to use the menu options and how to go through each feature and set it up. K8 MRD Radio has the absolute best video out there on how to program this radio through the keypad. So I'm going to reference his video in the description below. I'm going to freeform this conversation a little bit more than I usually do, just off the cuff, give you my opinion about this radio, about TID radio, and about manufacturers in Asia, specifically China, and what we ham radio operators want to see. TID Radio did send this to me for my use, review, and opinion, and you're going to see very quickly that it is indeed my opinion. I'm a fan of TID Radio. I think they've attempted some very good things. I think they've stretched the ham community. I think they've challenged other manufacturers, but they've also fallen down flat. Now, I just want to have an open and honest conversation about that today. Ham radio operators, we go and we spend money on a piece of gear, and whether it's $30 for a Baofang or $700 for one of the more premium brand of radios. We want it to work right out of the box. We know there are certain areas within Asia when we get something out of the box, the firmware's updated, all of the hardware is correct. It's gone through testing in the thousands of hours through hundreds of users, and it just works. That's not always the case when we have a manufacturer shipping something to us from China. And we have a certain level of tolerance for that, but I think our level of tolerance is beginning to shrink especially as many ham radio operators today actually have test equipment at their disposal, which is possibly manufactured one block down the street from the manufacturer of this particular radio. We have our nano VNAs. We can check spurious emissions. We have the ability as an individual user to really test out these radios. I think our expectations have kind of gone up. We've raised the bar. And I think some of the manufacturers out of China are struggling to keep up with that. Not all of them. Redivis is known as a manufacturer that when they ship product, the firmware is spot on, the hardware is tested and is functional, and there aren't spurious emissions. That's not always the case. I recently gave TalkPod a piece of my mind. That was clickbait on my little shot there on YouTube to get your attention. And TalkPod came back to me and gave me some very favorable response about what this they're doing to make their radio better. TID Radio has received a great deal of criticism on the TDH8, both the ham radio version as well as the GMRS version. As a matter of fact, they took it off the market for a period of time to respond to all of our concerns. But when they reintroduced version 2, guess what? Version 2 came out with problems. As a matter of fact, it came out with spurious emissions. Let's come back to that spurious emissions discussion in just a minute. But first, I want to talk about the things that I really like about this radio. First of all, this clear polymer. This is just very attractive to me of being a child of the 60s. I don't know why I like clear plastic, especially when I can see through the case and get a view of some of the electronic components. That's a very awesome feature of this. Of course, that has nothing to do with making QSOs and the quality of the transmission of this radio. It's just something that I particularly like. I can say as well that this radio has a really good feel in the hand. And some people just, they don't respond really well to that comment. It just means that it has a quality feel. We can tell the difference between something that feels cheap and something that feels quality. This has a good hand feel. It's a brick style. It has some weight to it. It feels sturdy. And maybe that's a better way to put it. It feels durable. So I like how it feels. I like how it looks. I like the interface on the screen. It's a beautiful color screen. But this interface is something just a little bit different than we're seeing on ham radios today. And I think a lot of us do indeed like that interface and how it looks. We like how the channel or the name is showing on the screen. And of course, we can adjust that. So TID Radio did a really good job of working with the user interface. TID Radio, I believe, has made this so that it can be programmed with Chirp, as well as they have their own programming software 
through. And oh, by the way, it can be programmed via Bluetooth using your phone and a TID Radio app. TID Radio has taken some criticism on that app regarding privacy and security. And so I think they need to continue to push that forward and make sure that they overcome users' concerns. But they've done a really good job of making sure we can program this radio in a number of ways. Let's jump back to that spurious emissions issue before we talk about some of the other positive features about this radio. And some of the features that are included on this radio, I think, are challenging some of the mainstays, right? They're some of the big three or the big two, however many of them are truly, really left. We all know there's ICOM and there's Yesu. I think manufacturers like this have speed to market. They have adaptability that some of the larger manufacturers don't. And that is one of the benefits of having gear like this coming from a region where they do respond quickly. They don't always get it right, but they're pushing other manufacturers towards things that are important to us. Spurious emissions. Who cares? I talked a good bit about this when I did my talk pod discussion. And let me say this, TID Radio, we don't want to be testing your radios for spurious emissions. That should never happen. It should never, ever, ever, ever happen again that a ham radio operator picks up a HT that came out of Asia and finds that it has spurious emissions and the manufacturer goes, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. How can you not have engineers that are employed by you to make sure that the design keeps spurious emissions out of a radio? And then we're back to who cares? Well, I care. When first responders are needing to care for my family that may have been in an accident, whether it's my wife on the street, my adult children that don't live near me, or my grandchildren that are far away. If there's a first responder caring for them, if it's local and it's my wife and I'm playing on my inexpensive radio and my spurious emissions are in interfering with first responders, that bothers me. That concerns me. And it should be a concern for me, for you and your family and their well-being. Radios like this with spurious emissions can get into first responder radio transmissions, and we don't want to be doing that. Those of you who buy these cool radios because they're feature rich and you think, ah, I can buy a ton of them compared to buying one premium radio from a manufacturer. So who cares about spurious emissions? In a true SHTF situation, you want a small footprint and spurious emissions take your transmission and they multiply it over and over on multiple frequencies. You're growing your footprint and you don't want that. Spurious emissions are not only illegal and the FCC could get you, it's just not smart. So while when I first got into ham radio, I used my UV5R. It's what got me started. As I began to understand more about spurious emissions, I'm certainly less likely to use a radio that has them. And how TID Radio could have gone through multiple iterations and still introduced something to us in version two, after it was well stocked in all of their warehouses with spurious emissions, that's a huge failure. Now, I believe that TID Radio has informed me that this radio came to me without spurious emissions. They fixed it. And when I specifically asked, and exactly what did you do? I got a lot of ambiguity and I'm not comfortable with that. I would like to know what they did to the radio. Did they change hardware after they registered for their FCC registration? It would seem to me that you can't be doing that. So what did you do? I guess if you did it in software, that wouldn't require a change to FCC. I don't know. I don't know those rules. But none of us really know what they did to negate or remove the spurious emissions. Is that important to you? It's important to me. I don't know what stock in the Amazon warehouse still is of that old stock. Still has version two or iteration two, but it has spurious emissions, but not my radio. Well, what about the one that you're going to buy? I wish TID Radio would have pulled them all off the shelf a second time. Whatever fix they applied to mine, they applied them to all. And then everybody knows they're buying a radio without spurious emissions. To make it on the HOA ham, HT wall of fame, you have to have a very narrow profile. Now through the trickery of my YouTube studio, what you see as behind me is actually right in front of me. So that metal pegboard is in front of me and those shelves are very shallow. So for an HT to make it there, you have to have a cradle that allows me to put a right angle adapter on, or my preference is that you have a USB-C charging capability. And then I also have 
have to be able to put a right angle adapter on. But it assumes something else. And it assumes, first of all, that you do have USB-C charging, but that it is not in the base of the unit. And that's not just important for my HT wall of fame. From my perspective, that's important for every ham radio operator. When I sit at my workstation, if I'm using an HT, it is not laying flat like this one is. It's lying up on its end and I'm looking at it. And you can't do that when you have a USB-C charge port in the bottom of the radio, which we do here. So I'm grateful for USB-C, but those manufacturers out there and TID Radio and all the rest of you, we want USB-C, but I'm going to say predominantly I could be wrong, just my opinion, that most operators are sitting their radios on desktops like this. And even more importantly, the first one of you to beat the paradigm that you can't charge while it's on and you're listening and transmitting, you beat that paradigm, you're ahead of everybody else. Because I think right now the standard is you can't listen, you can't transmit while it's charging. It's either charge or not charge and transmit and receive. So there's a paradigm for you, right? Paradigms are meant to be broken. Here's a challenge for you guys out there. Figure out how to have a USB on the side or the back so I can stand my radio up like this and charge so I can also listen and talk at the same time. That's what we want. I think we all want to trust our gear manufacturers. We want to believe that you have our best interest at heart. Now, in reality, you have shareholder interest at heart. I get that. But if you have happy and committed customers, shareholders will be taken care of. If all you care about is shareholders, if you play the Wall Street type games where end of quarters is all that matters, you know what? You're not looking out for customers. You're looking out for yourselves. You need to be looking out for customers. Create brand loyalty. So I think as TID Radio has come to the market, they've had some very compelling things to offer. They have great pricing on their Amazon store. You can pick up some of the Bofang equipment or some of their private labeled equipment for unbelievably uh, low prices. It's, it's quite amazing what they sell you for the dollars that you exchange. It's a great value. But we want more than just great value. We want to know that you're trustworthy. So when you have issues, we want a little bit more transparency. We want you to be more aware of other customers that might be getting units that could be defective and just leaving them in the store. I don't think that's a good way to approach that until that depletes. And we'll just make Make sure that the next batch that gets delivered to the store, you know, that it's right. I might be characterizing that not quite accurately. I don't have all the facts. It's my perception. And TID Radio, we really want to trust you. We like what you've done in so many ways. You've challenged some of the mainstay manufacturers. You've responded to the criticism. You've brought features back in iteration two that weren't there in iteration one. You're listening to us. Now create trust, create brand loyalty by the way that you conduct your business so that we know we can always come back and get a device that's produced and engineered to the highest standards possible. That's what we want. Do all ham radio operators and all ham radio YouTubers agree with me? Well, of course not. And that's one of the great things about the United States of America and about YouTube. You can subscribe to whomever you want. You don't like a video, you can put a nasty comment there, whether it's deserved or not. So I don't expect that everybody's going to agree with me. I'm just giving my opinion. I think when I was a little boy, I think there was uh, kind of a perception that everything that came out of Japan was poor quality. But, you know, has that ever changed over time? And let's face it, what comes out of China? It's a little bit bipolar. There are some things that are incredibly poor quality. And then there are some other things that are just unbelievably complex and sophisticated. My iPhone was manufactured in China. I have several pieces of gear that were manufactured in China. Phenomenal gear. And then I've got some things that are just junk. So the perception that everything that comes out of China is not anything that's good and worthy of our dollars, that's a false perception. My opinion, you can differ with that. Do I buy USA made? Anytime I have a chance, I most certainly do. But you know what? I can't pick up radios like this made in the USA. Can I pick up any HT that's made in the USA? Not that I know of.
So I definitely want to be buying from manufacturers that have built brand loyalty, have built trust, have brought features that are compelling, have brought pricing that is reasonable. And TID Radio, although they've stumbled a couple of times along the way, and I'm still not real happy with what they did with this and bringing it out with spurious emissions in version two, how they purged or didn't purge their store. You know what? I'm not real happy about that. And I'm not recommending you buy this radio because I don't know when that Amazon uh, balance depletes. It's probably already gone. Am I going to use my radio? Yeah, I am. So I don't know what to do about that. That's really up to you individually. The radio itself is a compelling piece of gear. It's well-made, it's full-featured, I really like it an awful lot. So I'm hoping that TID Radio can build off of this success and continue to build some brand loyalty, continue to come back to us with compelling gear and build that trust so that over time we know that anything new that comes out of TID Radio, we know when it hits the ground, it's ready to operate. I hope you found this useful. It's fine with me if you don't completely agree or you don't agree at all. Some of you do. Just be nice in the comments below. That's all I ask. You can go ahead and give an opposing opinion. Just don't call me names. Unless it's HOA ham. Talk to you soon, friend. 73.